Chapter six. It may seem easy with hindsight to realise that a sticker on a CD is not an overly dramatic event. Not compared with planes crashing into the World Trade Centre, the Third World Debt, and the state of the seats on the back row of the Salisbury Odeon. But at the time, I was more than a little agitated. Anyone brought up on a solid diet of James Bond and Die Hard, where a cryptic note on a CD inevitably leads to frenetic chases, large amounts of gratuitous destruction, hopefully a little nudity, and possibly the odd assassination, will know how I felt. Well. I'll be buggery snozzled. I hope this isn't going to get violent. I remember thinking, or words to that effect. I could picture the vicar talking at the conference while a man with an orange eyebrow assassinated him with a rifle disguised as a video camera. Perhaps this was the moment that I'd been born for. The defining moment of my life. Punks, 15 minutes of fame. All right, all right, let's not get too carried away. I know I'm just an underpaid production assistant with a strange attraction to internet pornography, but fate can come knocking on the most unusual doors. And my door is pretty unusual. It has this strange drawing of a woman with a handle just where you might want to fondle. I sat in the reception room, my pulse racing as if I'd just run a marathon. What is it with adrenaline? Isn't it meant to help you be alert in a crisis? It seems to me that it has exactly the opposite effect. Here I was, needing to be clear-headed, and my body was fast becoming reduced to a, a gibbering wreck by my fucking adrenal gland. Excuse my French. We may think that we're oh so sophisticated, but in the end, we're all controlled by our glands. Adrenaline and semen, the two defining substances in a man's life, with the possible addition of alcohol and caffeine, I suppose. So there I was, suffering all the symptoms of a mild cardiac arrest, huffing and puffing my way towards the best course of action. It was too late to discuss it with the vicar. I would simply have to survey the room and try to locate the infamous orange eyebrow. What I'd do when I actually saw him, I, I didn't stop to consider. I positioned myself halfway down the right hand side of the conference hall, surveying the crowd of a couple of hundred people. There was only enough seats for about half of them, and the rest were squeezed into the aisles or sitting on the floor in the front, crowded right up against the table where the speakers were going to sit. In the middle of the room, there was a large video camera. Now have no fears, faithful viewers, I'd already checked out the camera in best detective fashion. The cameraman had showed me a computer in the corner of the room where you could indeed see the pictures coming from his camera, ready for a webcast. Imagine what it must be like to be a professional bodyguard. The vicar likes to tell me this story about George Martin and Brian Epstein watching a concert in the US. Yeah, another one of his Beatles stories. After the band had received some death threats, possibly over the we're bigger than Jesus to Lasco. Anyway, in watching this concert, they realised how totally vulnerable the group were to snipers or assassins and how little they could do about it. I looked around the conference hall. Most of the people in the room either had a camera or mobile phone or virtually all of them were carrying them large medium bags which could hide any weapon of choice. Not that I was really getting too hung up on the weapon thing. I mean, most of you will know that he doesn't get shot because I've already told you that he's still happily, or unhappily, alive long after the events of this book, moaning about these blogs. Rather ruins my dramatic tension, doesn't it? But I was genuinely afraid that some crazed fan might, you know, make a disturbance, throw a rotten vegetable or some choice animal excrement. I was concentrating so hard that I barely noticed a hand being slipped around my waist from behind. Hello, gorgeous. Have you been keeping me a seat? I turned to see Venus standing beside me. Hi, I said sheepishly. I thought you were in town stretching Lord Crap and his credit cards. Plenty of time for that. I'm a professional. You'd be amazed how much I can spend in less than an hour. Not that money buys everything. She gave me a friendly squeeze. A good man goes a long way. I'm not sure that you've quite got that right. Whatever. Are you planning to stand here through the whole thing? Is it going to be really boring? Well, not really. The vicar will be... I realised she'd skillfully distracted me from my Kevin Costner bodyguard role. Shit, shit and double shit. Major brown pants moment. What if she was involved with the orange eyebrow and had been deliberately sent to disturb me? She and Lord Crappenley were on the top of my list of suspects for the note on the inside of my medium pass. Yet, yeah, wait a second, I said, and hurriedly stared around the room to see if anything had changed. You hardly need me to describe what a moment of pure panic is like. <clears throat> Remember the first time a girl says yes to your constant demands to get inside her knickers or, or when your mother walks into the chemist while you're being handed a packet of condoms. You step out of yourself and then BAM! You're back in the world again. Are you okay? Have you got the flu or something? I thought that you'd be pleased to see me. She joked in a spoilt child, my friends won't play with me kind of way. I'm fine, I, I was just looking for someone, I said, still slightly muggle-brained. He must have left. She stood looking at me, half smiling and half laughing to herself. I cringe as I remember the short scene that followed. I'm half tempted to admit it, but hey, I've never claimed to be super cool. Laugh all you like.
Some of us, I discovered, are more Austin Powers than Hercule Poirot, or, in my case, even Inspector Gadget. Oh, in fact, go, go, gadget me then, pass, would be a pretty good way of describing my plan as I casually started to play with the pass that was dangling around my neck. I kept glancing at Venus to see if she showed any reaction to this incriminating piece of evidence. You know the routine. I smile at her. She smiles awkwardly back. I toy with the pass. She smiles awkwardly back. I run the pass seductively through my fingers. She smiles awkwardly back. I take a closer look at the sticker. She smiles awkwardly back. A bit like one of those Woody Allen films. Oh, no, more like Laurel and Hardy, the way he flicks his tie with his little finger while he's smiling to himself. Generally, a total fuckeroony. What's wrong with you? She laughed. Why do you keep looking at me like that? And why are you fiddling with your pass? She tried to take it out of my hand. Having worked so hard to get a reaction out of her, I was now desperate to stop her from seeing it. No, that's mine, I said, trying to lock it firmly in my closed fingers. You've got your own. What's so wrong with it? The photo can't be worse than the real thing. I'll show you mine if you show me yours. She fluttered her eyebrows at me. Eyebrows! Shit, 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 the orange eyebrow! I turned and, and surveyed the room again. Quite what I expected to see, I'm not sure. It, it was now so crowded, it, it was impossible to see anything. There was a movement at the far end, and I squeezed forward as the man walked up to the podium in front of the high table. It was about to start too late to warn the vicar. That boy's not Midem is pleased to welcome Bruce Fanny of Swapster.com, Vincentis Smagala of uh, What If Corporation, and the producer known to us all as The Vicar. Yes, she was in my ear. He is my husband, and we do sleep in the same bed. Although, the way she said it made me think she could just easily have carried on to say, 